we're going to talk about the American Association of Christian Counselors. And to discuss this uh, wonderful association, I'm glad to have with us Dr. Carl Benzio. And he is the medical director of the American Association of Christian Counselors. He's also the founder of Lighthouse Network um, and a Christian psychiatrist at Lighthouse Psychiatry. So, Dr. Benzio, thanks a lot for joining me. Hey, great to be with you, Ray, and your listeners today. Yeah. Um, so we we love interviewing people about the professional associations out there because they do so much great work for the community and clinicians, even though people don't realize that they're that they're working hard every day for them, uh, for advocacy and training and best practices, standards, all these kind of things. Um so just to start, if maybe you can just tell us a bit about yourself. Like, how did you get into psychiatry? What drew you to psychiatry? Wow, it's, uh, I don't know how long of a show you have, but um, I'm sort of an odd bird as most psychiatrists are. But, uh, you know, when I was five years old, Ray, um, God just laid on my heart decision-making. I was very interested in decision-making. Um, I was a kid who stuttered a lot. I started school when I was in four, uh, four years old, and uh, I stuttered really uh, really bad, very significant stammering. Um, also had a bad lisp. So I had went to speech class from kindergarten through fourth grade. So I got made fun of a lot, got bullied. Uh, people would slap me on the back of the head to get my, you know, to get that word out uh, kind of thing, got made fun of. And, um, you know, I grew up in a home that uh, my parents were real young when they got married and uh, there was some dysfunction and struggle and in, in the home and, and just saw some difficulties around me. You know, I had anger and frustration and tantrums and just, um, uh, boy, if I were, were better decision maker, if people were better decision makers around me, the world would be a wonderful place. And so it's just very interested in decision making at that young age. And um, I didn't know that it was a psychiatrist or in the psychology field that helped decision makers. I, um, uh, you know, watched I Dream a Genie and there was Dr. Bellows. I watched MASH and Sidney Freeman and the Bob Newhart show. And I started to realize, oh, that psychiatrist is the one who helps with decision making. And then um, my second grade Sunday school teacher uh, said, hey, if, if you had one wish, what would you wish for? And I was like, boy, you know, as a kid, I wished for peanut butter milkshakes and baseball cards. And she said, well, you know, there's a place yes. in the Bible where God is a genie and gives one wish. And he, she opens to the, you know, the book of First Kings and it's Solomon. And in a dream, God said, Solomon, whatever you wish for, I'll give you. And Solomon wished for wisdom or to be, as she said, a godly decision maker, you know, to know what the right thing to do is and wow. then to be able to do it. And, um, and the very next verse is, and God was pleased. And if you look at that from a psychological perspective, no matter what you wish for, you know, if there's things with, you know, within your realm, we obviously can't wish for people to come back from the dead or God control other people for us. He's not our puppeteer that can match other people. But the things that are within your control, if you wish for I want a good marriage. Um, I want good health. I want a good job. But if you're a poor decision maker, you would lose each one of those things. You know, if I sure. wanted to wish for a good marriage, but then I went out and had an affair with poor decisions, I would lose my good marriage, right? Or if I wanted a good job but stole from my employer, I'd lose that good job. Uh, so it really comes down to decision making. That's the most important thing that we have 100% control over. So my pursuit has been that decision making sciences. Um, I went to Duke, majored in biomedical engineering because in as a teenager, I saw the $6 million man and I figured, oh, if we can make a bionic brain, we could figure it all out. Uh -huh. and, uh, so it's just in that space of, you know, before artificial intelligence and all that kind of stuff, how, you know, how do we really master this really cool thing that God created our mind and this whole element of free will that he's given us to be our own decision makers. And uh, then I had my struggles in uh, because of some of the issues younger and we moved around a lot when I was a kid. So I had anxiety, depression, I uh, drank a lot, used drugs, gambling. Uh, I lost a baseball scholarship at Duke. I lost my Air Force ROTC scholarship. I got caught cheating on a differential equations test and got put on academic probation, almost flunked out. Thankfully, I'm a good test taker. I was able to get on the waiting list in medical school. And two days before the, the uh, medical school uh, started in late August, uh, the registrar's office called and said, Carl, this is a miracle. We've never gone this low on our waiting list before, but we've come to your number. What would you like <laughs> to do? And I was like, oh, hallelujah, man. I'm in. Yes. You know, I'll, I'll find the money somehow. I, you know, I'm in. So I started medical school. And, but in my second year, um, it, 
continued to drink, have problems, uh, fights, uh, had DUI, then eventually I got arrested for six counts of aggravated assault and was in jail. And uh, God said to me, not my audible voice, but in my heart, hey, Carl, you may be your savior when you were a little kid, but if you make me the Lord of your life, I'm going to teach you things about decision making that's going to transform your life and help you transform other people's lives as well. And at that, my I started to in, infuse my faith a lot more into my uh, scientific understanding of the mind and psychological processes. And I sort of opened the Bible, the best instruction book for living every day. Our creator gave us an instruction manual as to how to use this really cool thing that he designed in us. And my life has been, you know, God has blessed me in amazing ways to be involved in uh, uh, in helping thousands and thousands of patients transform their lives, We're working in organizations in uh, a very macro level to really impact public policy, uh, other countries and, uh, and the field in a, in a really dynamic and neat way. Wow. That, that's a, that's a really powerful story. And, uh, yeah, your, your turnaround there and the decision-making like for yourself and now helping others do it. Um, yeah. I know a lot of people that do great things have had challenging beginnings. Yeah. Yeah. God is definitely the author of great comebacks. And I think for every person, you know, we all have uh, loss, trauma, change, adversity, trials, tribulations, mm-hmm. however you want to frame it. Nobody comes up from a perfect background with, you know, no losses and no adversities. And um, uh, oftentimes, especially patients that we work with feel that there's no hope. Uh, this is just the way it's always going to be. But then uh, they often quit at halftime or at intermission and, and leave. And uh, in my life and in many people's lives, it's, you know, if you hang in there, uh, and you start to let you know the, the director sort of direct the play and you just act your part. Uh, he's the author of Great Comebacks, has a great comeback story for uh, mm. for everybody if they're willing to walk. And I think the last phase of healing for people is whenever they're able to not only be healed from their troubles and their struggles, but to see how they can actually use those to help other people heal in the yes. process and how God can use the crappiest of things, not only to heal your life, but then to, you can share that, or you make a connection with somebody because you've been abused. You can connect with somebody who's been abused. You've lost a child. You can connect with somebody who's lost a child. You have cancer. You can connect to somebody who is, you know, facing their mortality with cancer. It allows you to have that connection and to use that crappy stuff to be a blessing to somebody else's life and to bless them and to help them move on their journey of healing. To me, I think that's the last phase of healing for that many people often miss out on because they're sometimes embarrassed or ashamed to share their story. Right. And obviously we don't want to be TMI and just, you know, sure. <laughs> flood a person with all our crud kind of thing, but there's appropriate times and appropriate spaces uh, to be able to use that in context, to be able to share with somebody to help them connect so they don't feel alone, isolated. They're the only one struggling with this particular issue to help them embark on their healing process. Yeah. And a lot of people probably think, oh, they're the, you know, their medical physician, their psychiatrist, their doctor, like, yeah, they they came out of the womb being studious and obedient <laughs> and behaving and you know, good mental health and like, yeah, just uh hitting the books. Um <laughs> so yeah, I mean, your testimony you know, I think is really powerful and definitely can make people feel like, Hey, my, my doctor can relate to some of the challenges mm-hmm. I'm having, like have an understanding here. It's not, I'm not from like a, a different universe. The fact that I'm struggling with things. You know, yeah. I think that the, the struggle in our field of, of behavioral health is that a lot of times we're indoctrinated with the idea that you need to be the blank slate. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and not really share, not divulge, not, not be, you know, cause you might, then influence what a patient shares with you. Right. They know that you have a certain belief or a certain opinion of something. They might hold stuff back. And then how can you really yeah. help them if they're holding back information? I believe that they come to me for my expertise and my expertise comes packaged in a bunch of different ways, spiritually, psychologically, scientifically, they all sort of blend together. And, uh, you know, through my experience and through my training, through research, a whole bunch of different things, helping many patients. And so, you know, how do we impart that? Obviously, there's some opinions and there's some views of what's right and what's wrong that, you know, mm-hmm. we're called upon to share that expertise, what the patient does with it. We don't want to hold things against them if they don't follow our guidance and our opinions, but I think it's incumbent on us to share, you know, some of what we've learned and uh, in those opinions yeah. with our patients. And that's part of that expertise package that they're coming to get our consultation on. Right. Right. I think, I think they do. They want someone that has a different viewpoint, better, maybe some better decision-making processes <laughs> as you, as you talk about. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
Yeah. So, and what, what drew you to uh, the American Association of Christian Counselors and getting involved in that way and, you know, being the medical director and putting in your time? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I started in the secular world working in hospitals. I ran adolescent units and had success running adolescent units Um, as uh, with my decision making curriculum. As it as it grew, I wanted to have a a more overt Christian uh, flavor to it and uh, it got resistance. So I moved out and that's when I started my private practice, Lighthouse Psychiatry and Lighthouse Network, trying to really integrate faith and science. That's sort of how I practiced and saw great success with it and wanted to do that, you know, more significantly. Um, So part of what I did was I educated the church about this whole psychological field, you know, the church uh, and faith sometimes don't go together in a lot of Christians' minds. So uh, they would go years and years with a significant depression or eating disorder or addiction and not get good clinical help. Uh, but then also trying to educate my clinical colleagues that they're leaving out the spirituality. And so we see a low ceiling of success when we leave out this most important sphere of uh, sphere of spirituality. Uh, so Lighthouse Network grew uh, with that. We grew the biggest helpline. Um, I've transitioned from that. I'm no longer involved with Lighthouse Network, but uh, I started to be a consultant to a bunch of different treatment facilities, putting in Christian programs, mainly for addiction uh, facilities. And as I grew, uh, the AACC uh, is an organization that helps educate um, clinicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, master's level therapists, but also uh, non-clinicians that are in that pastoral care, uh, coaching, um, lay people that are interested in uh, helping bring their faith and science to be able to help people, whether in the church or in uh, group homes or uh, other volunteer ministries that they're uh, involved with. Uh, So I started working with them, lecturing, uh, being part of their lecture team and uh, sort of addictions and mental health integration kind of stuff. So I worked with Tim Clinton and a bunch of his staff over the years. I ended up starting a facility called Honey Lake Clinic, uh, founded that in 2017 with a couple other of my uh, uh, colleagues and partners, a uh, great Christian treatment center down there. And as that continued to grow, um, realized that there's not very many other places like that. And so how to push into this bigger space of um, faith and science integration, but also protecting, uh, infusing faith into treatment services. So uh, there's a lot of opposition uh, in various places in our government to uh, really restrict religious liberty, uh, both for treaters that want to uh, use those principles in their treatment process, but also educators that educate up and graduate students in uh, psychology, uh, social work, uh, LMFTs, uh, LPCs, uh, psychologists and uh, medical schools. Uh, they're really trying to restrict the curriculum. So there's credentialing agencies. So uh, the AACC, uh, focus on the family I work with, uh, are real involved in those spaces. So, uh, you know, I approached them and said, hey, look, you know, I think we can really synergize some of our efforts a lot more. And uh, Tim was very gracious and said, hey, yeah, well, we would like to move into that medical space a little bit more and infuse some of your metal, medical expertise into our uh, we do a lot of CEU programs for uh, therapists and a lot of conferences and educational uh, online materials. And uh, so I joined them uh, a year ago uh, in a formal way to be the medical director at the AACC to uh, help with light counseling, which is their outpatient uh, department that's in many states and provide some virtual care. And I help oversee uh, the medical aspects of that, bringing on nurse practitioners, but then speaking into a lot of the other uh, clinical aspects that we have as far as education and uh, resourcing, um, and then some uh, advocacy uh, that we do in those bigger, bigger uh, social policy issue spaces. Yeah. So, you know, clinicians, but even people that are not a clinician, but are in the kind of the helping field that want to incorporate their Christian faith into the services that they're providing the association really supports them. You're saying with continuing education resources, bringing people together conferences, but also advocacy on like policy, legal type issues that impact them and and how they want to provide care, but also adhering to their faith beliefs. Um, Yeah. And one thing that's unique is the fact that AACC actually provides some treatment. Uh, like, you know, other associations, AACC is the only one that I'm aware of that um, also provides some treatment. So you're talking about like the virtual services and the, the counseling that's provided. Yeah. So light counseling is a division of uh, the AACC. So we have uh, 
well, I don't know how many clinicians we have. Uh, I want to say like maybe 30 or 40 clinicians. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, we're licensed in more and more states, probably about maybe nine or 10 states. We're looking hopefully uh, within a year, probably be licensed in all 50 states to provide uh, clinical services, at least virtually, if not uh, brick and mortar uh, spaces for people to be able to get to and uh, uh, do face-to-face clinical um, evaluations and ongoing care as well. Yeah. So what really led you to AACC is the uh, advocacy part. Um, Is that right? You really wanted to, you know, ensure that policies and laws um, are not impeding and and also supporting, right? Being able to live out your faith in in your practice and the treatment you provide. Yeah, there's two main things. One is that um, in this space of, uh, you know, we're, we're in the behavioral health space. The behavioral health space is a very fractured space. You know, we talk about integration, uh, but there's a lack of integration in so many ways. There's, we separate mental health and addiction instead of integrating them together. Right. Uh, we separate uh, medical and psychiatric, even though they should be, you know, integrated together. We separate faith and secular, even though they should be integrated together. We're right. even separated insurance wise. There's carve outs to do behavioral health you know, insurance versus the mainstream yes. insurance company, you know, so there's just such a lack of integration. And yeah. um, so for me, uh, uh, being able to come alongside um, a lot of Christian providers are working, whether they're in research, academia, or in the clinical space, um, you know, we all do our work, we work hard, we're working 60 hours in this behavioral health disaster that we're in at this time. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're all uh, you know, 60, 70, you know, there's, there's, there's way more need than there is supply uh, providers. So we end up being pretty siloed. Uh, we don't like to work with each other yeah, very much. Yeah. We're pretty isolative. We like to do right. things our own way and be pretty autonomous. So synergy, collaboration, it doesn't happen very often in the medical field, in the behavioral right. health field, or in the faith-based arena. So you put those three together and you have people working very hard uh, but in isolation and sort of parallel. And so yep. part of my passion and my, you know, this sort of maybe last season of, uh, of, of work, so to speak, in, in ministry is to how do I bring those elements together? There's a, a place in the Bible where there's a guy named Nehemiah who God laid on his heart to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and, re, you know, rebuild that uh, um, that was in shambles and disarray from being mm-hmm. overrun. And uh, to me, I feel my calling is to be a Nehemiah type person to help rebuild the city of healing that Jesus initially built. And so, um, you know, it's in disarray. Our, our society is, is pretty chaotic. There's a lot of strife, a lot of contention, a lot of suffering. Uh, the CDC won't, won't put it this way, but if you look at the real numbers, addiction is the number one killer in the U.S. Suicide is the number two killer in the U.S. And abortion is the number three killer in the U.S. Uh, Mm -hmm. Lower down, there's cardiovascular, cancer, and COVID is what the CDC will list. But around a million is addiction, around 925,000 is suicide, and about um, maybe seven, 800,000, and that's not even counting the unknown amount or the undocumented uh, abortions. Um, And then cardiovascular is about 650, 690,000. So people are dying and um, we need to bring together this group of people. So part of my passion is how do we bring together uh, people that are uh, interested in science, interested in healing, interested in providing good clinical care, but also from a faith-based standpoint and and bring all those different people. They're they're all over the United States doing some great research and academia and providing treatment. But how do Mm -hmm. we bring them together to synergize our efforts a lot more potently and how do I uh, align um, other organizations as a psychiatrist you sort of get to see a lot of what's happening there's not that many Christian psychiatrists not that many psychiatrists but Christian psychiatrists even rare so I have the 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 benefit of being involved in a lot of different spaces and uh, administratively clinically so I used to be an insurance reviewer so just all those different elements I have an understanding uh, for and can bring to uh, to bear yeah. in, in sort of the problem solving process so how to bring AACC focus on the family, Christian medical and dental caps is a psychology association, uh, national association or North American association of Christian social workers. So just bringing these groups together so we can have more synergy and, and yeah. research and uh, you know, in the field. And then as we're trying to grow more treatment options uh, there's legislation and there's credentialing agencies that are trying to restrict 
our ability to apply our faith, to have religious uh, freedom um, or right of conscience, whether it's physician assisted suicide, uh, abortion, uh, transgender treatment, um, they're actually dictating medical practice. Uh, so I would just testified uh, before Health and Human Services uh, a couple of months ago with uh, two pediatricians and an OBGYN uh, about just um, the idea that uh, social transitioning, chemical transitioning, and surgical transitioning, Health and Human Services wants to make that the treatment of choice for kids that are struggling with gender confusion, gender incongruence, gender dysphoria, as opposed to the good old fashioned psychotherapy, like we used to do in the olden days, you know, five years ago, right, and had great success with um, allowing puberty to play out and most uh, about 92% uh, come through puberty uh, and with a, a better sense of who they are, what they are, what their biological sex and gender really is. Um, there's various different credentialing agencies uh, that say, here's what you got to teach in graduate school. And here's how you actually have to practice. They're trying to push that uh, down my throat as a clinician telling me how to practice. They're not even clinicians telling me how clinically I need to practice and what are best practices for me. So, you know, we're trying to fight that fight to be able to protect our right of conscience and what, what, what good science is and protect and allow good science to prevail in how we uh, manage some of these you know, very delicate politicized uh, situations of uh, that impact behavioral health and a person being able to, to walk in the, the God given potential that God designed in them and the abundant life that he has for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in, so AACC is providing a lot to the community and to clinicians and, you know, those in the caring, uh, kind of field, um, why should people become a member of uh, AACC or how can they get involved? Um, you know, what, what maybe resources should they look for? Uh, how can they get involved in the advocacy uh, that you're speaking to? Yeah, that's yeah. a great question. Uh, AACC.net is the website. Um, we have conferences uh, every year. We have a national conference uh, in the even years in uh, Dallas. We'll have about 2,500 people there uh, first week of September. And then we have our world conference. Where we have 7,500 uh, members show up for that. And uh, we have um, 25 tracks, seven workshops on each track, uh, you know, evidence-based, providing CEUs on all the tracks, uh, understanding how to infuse um, faith, in science, how to understand well, what is your craft and how to be better at your craft using evidence-based uh, uh, assessment tools, uh, treatment tools, um, with how to integrate your faith into that. You know, there's um, there's absolutes uh, that our designer has designed into how we function, how our brain works. Actually, the more we apply those, we actually see spec scans getting better in the process. And so, uh, you know, we have, whether it's a marriage and family, whether it's a parenting track, whether it's neuroscience, uh, uh, coaching track, ethics, um, uh, psychodynamics, there's just a whole bunch of different tracks that uh, people can sign up for and, uh, and see workshops on uh, to really be, uh, you know, to integrating their, uh, their craft and their faith together uh, to be able to have synergy uh, there, you know. Decision making, um, neuroplasticity, that beautiful principle that God designed into our brains means that, you know, the decisions that we make influence our brain chemistry. We make good decisions, our brain chemistry gets better. When we make wrong decisions, though, our brain chemistry gets worse or short circuited, chemically imbalanced, whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, but neuroplasticity doesn't know direction. It's based on the quality of our decisions. Well, what determines the quality of our decisions is our spiritual belief system. So our belief system plays into our decisions and forms our decisions. And then our decisions uh, then reverberate on our brain chemistry and affect our brain chemistry. Now, what do we believe? You know, what are those absolutes? What are those truths? Where do we get them from? You know, I believe that, uh, you know, the Bible is uh, the great decision-making textbook and our designer uh, who designed our brain said, hey, look, Here's the things to do to make your brain stronger and don't do these things because this makes your brain weaker or short circuited or double minded or reprobate or degenerate or there's various biblical uh, terms that, de- uh, um, that define sort of neuroplasticity gone the wrong direction. And so what we do at uh, CEUs, there's online, uh, there's uh, in person um, 
there's a helpline uh, that we have that takes calls from all over the country to help people find uh, care through our uh, through our various members there. And then, like we said, we just hosted a, um, a religious liberty summit at uh, Liberty University um, to be able to help people start to understand, well, what are their rights? You know, a lot of clinicians don't know what their rights are as far as their ability to uh, express their religion and bring their faith and faith principles uh, into their clinical practice uh, kind of thing. So there are a lot of protections that various different legal agencies have fought for and, and protect, but a lot of clinicians don't know that that's available for them. And sometimes there's a you know, there's a cancel society, both with professors and uh, people that are expressing their faith, whether in Christian universities or in uh, non-Christian universities, but then also clinicians that are applying that faith. So to be able to help clinicians out there that are listening, that are uh, interested in uh, involving their faith and infusing their faith into the practice, there's a lot of rights that you have uh, and opportunities to be able to do that in an appropriate ethical uh, format, uh, but that is protected. But most therapists, like most teachers, most teachers don't know that they think separation of church and state, they can't bring uh, their faith into the classroom, but they can bring a uh, Bible into the classroom. They can wear a cross. They can, there are certain things that you can do that are protected by the ACLU and, and other um, uh, legal organizations that we do have rights under the First Amendment, religious liberty rights. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's really helpful. So, uh, as you're listening to this interview, please check out the American Counseling, uh, American, the American Association of Christian Counselors. Um, I've been to one of the conferences and it was, it was really fantastic. Really. I went to the, uh, the international conference. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, one year will be the national and then the next year will be the international and it'll, it'll, it'll cycle. Um, so yeah, definitely encourage you to check that out, check out the resources and the advocacy work that's being done. And, um, I think the idea, uh, of integration and the work that you've been doing on integration of different professions, uh, is something that other associations can probably really learn from and, and consider. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for your passion and the work that you do and your advocacy and reaching out and educating other clinicians in the community. Really appreciate it, uh, Dr. Benzio. Well, thanks, Ray. I appreciate yeah. what, you get, what you're doing and helping uh, just equip people to do their uh, to mm -hmm. do what they're called to do uh, better. And uh, for all you listeners, just thank you for uh, uh, stepping into messy spaces that oftentimes mm -hmm. people aren't uh, thrilled uh, to dive into mm -hmm. in other people's lives and sometimes avoid it. And uh, mm -hmm. I just thank you for, uh, you know, the calling that God's placed on your heart and the, and the willingness to to jump into the messy places and help uh, provide some healing and uh, a safe place for people to, you know, understand who they are, how God designed them and, uh, and you know, the great comeback story uh, that he has for them that you are uh, a great opportunity for them to access that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you.